thank you all very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. I've got my family from home, my family from Samsung, colleagues from Stanford, and even the president of SRI, so no pressure. Uh, well, I'm super happy to be here, and I also, before I get into my presentation, want to thank all the people who work behind the scenes to make this possible. They're absolutely amazing. Okay, so what am I going to talk about? Aside from the one chart where they made me talk about my background, I want to talk about how amazing things come from large numbers of entities. And what I mean by that is pieces of data, subatomic particles, cells, you name it. It's just large numbers of things. And it's not just having a lot of things that creates interest. I mean, a, a trillion sand particles won't become conscious. But it's the way they're connected together. And another part of my goal today is to do a little myth busting, which is this popular notion that if you have enough compute, you can compute anything. And there's things that I hope I can impress upon you are impossible to compute. And that's not a mathematical theorem, but it's a practical theorem. And I hope that when we're done, you'll have a feel for that or, and maybe disagree and talk to me later about it. So anyway, they made me do this personal journey chart, which I don't like talking about myself, but I went to school at Stanford. I joined the faculty, uh, taught for a long time there, um, took a little break after working on uh, chips with cells on them, which was fun to co-found a company called Cepheid, which um, we brought uh, electronics and math to molecular biology a long time ago, automated some things that were clunky, and helped, I think, a few people, and then did my government service at DARPA where I, I ran the Microsystems Technology Office, which is electronics, so we, the, the Moore's Law and other things people. And I'm happy to say back then, 10 years ago, we were investing in quantum computing, and I think we're gonna hear about some of the fruits of that and, of course, investments of others today. And now I have the honor of being at SRI, which is the coolest place you've ever heard of. 70 plus years, if you've used a computer mouse that came from SRI, uh, speech recognition on your phone, all kinds of things. So uh, that's where I am now, and, and it's a really great place to be. So this topic that I want to talk about today is about neat things happening when you have a lot of smaller things connected in interesting ways, and it's not supposed to be anything more than thought-provoking, and I'd love to hear from you afterwards what you think. So what I have here is a simple chart showing things, entities, whatever they happen to be, and I start at the top with subatomic particles. This is sort of big bang-ish kind of stuff. And then get down to societies of people, of which there aren't that many, but they're the result of billions, trillions of things compounding many, many times. And what I hope to leave you with is a feeling that when you really learn biology, instead of superficially, you'll be humbled beyond anything else. Because biology is orders of orders of magnitude more complicated than anything we code or build. And that's a fact. And so you hear a lot of people giving TED Talks about biology being code or biology, biology being a language. It's not true, not at all. In fact, as I'll say later on, biology, if it weren't for biology, we wouldn't have those things. Code and languages are just side effects of life. So on the the horizontal axis is the degree of complexity. And what I'm going to try to illustrate is how these things assemble, but they take a long time. And that's the other reason why, hopefully, you'll come to realize some of these things aren't computable. So from the Big Bang, we've had a long time, 10 to the 10 years, and you'll realize I'm very fond of powers of 10. I'm sorry about that. It's not PBS stuff, but I just like it. But it took a long time. And this is a theme I'll come back to, is nature sunk an enormous amount of energy into computing us. So when we expect to do that with our server farms, we may be a little disappointed, but basically you have these things come in together, and you see about 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, lots of things come together. You notice 10 to the 13 molecules in a cell. That's the same, coincidentally, as the number of cells, roughly in a human. And then we get consciousness, which is amazing, because it's reliable. Almost every human born is conscious right away. How does that work, right? It's not something that is gonna happen in your mainframe. And you know, then you have lots of people. The number of people, by the way, who've ever lived is about 10 to the 10, which is an interesting number um, since we've been you know, calling ourselves people. But you know, there's things that happen when you have large numbers of people. Big countries occur, they have their own dynamics, and so we're wondering always what's the next thing. But this is 10 to the 10 years. And there are people who will tell you their startups um, are going to do all this in a couple of years. They have 18 months runway. They're going to discover everything they can't. 
So I'm going to start with a warm-up exercise because we all have brains, right? I've been told, you know, we have two sons, sometimes dad doesn't, but we do generally have a brain, and it's, it's a modest number. It's only 100 billion things working together. So the brain is uh, not something that works accidentally. There's an awful lot of wiring, the folding, and that happens during the formation of an embryo. It doesn't happen afterwards, it doesn't happen by chance, and again, it's incredibly reliable. Most brains work pretty well. So, but you hear these people saying, um, I'm gonna start a company, it's a very famous people, so I'm gonna start a company that lets us jack into the brain, and if I'm thinking about a symphony, the computer will know. And I've heard, one of these famous people told me he was doing it because he was afraid we'd be enslaved by AI within a decade. So, okay, so the idea is if you're gonna be enslaved by AI, put a USB plug in the side of your head. That's a good idea, right? I think so, no. But so, this works because of the way things are connected. And I'm gonna swing from this to computers and try to give you a feel why I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon. So, EEG, electroencephalogram, is a way people try to talk to or listen to these 100 billion neurons. And it's kind of like trying to figure out what's going on in Manhattan by listening to all the conversations averaged together from space. You get a sense there's something going on, this ball game, a lot of people are excited, you know, they're watching something. But you don't really know someone's thinking about Bach or thinking about a steak or what they want to do. And so you ask these people, and look at me, I'm a perfect substrate for this, so put it on and tell me what I'm doing. So they could tell me, I was breathing, so not dead, good. Uh, not asleep, probably not. But they couldn't tell me anything about what I was doing beyond that. So this is a real boil down of a lot of neurons and very little information. So when you hear these stories, don't believe them, that we're gonna have a brain interface anytime soon that will be helpful for understanding details of thought. Because this system is so complicated, it's mind boggling. And we haven't even got to the molecules. The brain is amazing, it's got 100 billion neurons, roughly, give or take a few. And they talk to, each of them talks to 10 to the four different places. So that gives you about 10 to the 15, big number, bigger than the national debt, of connections between cells. Those are how we think we store information. And as Jung said, we really don't know this very well yet. Biology is still young as a science. And you know, it's not like engineering where we build on known principles. We can't build much with biology yet, but we're getting very good at understanding bits of it and manipulating a little. So if you look at that in terms of standard nerd terminology, what are the specs? Well, 10 to the 15 synapses, roughly equal to a byte, roughly quantized about 256 levels. The clock speed, how fast it computes, is only kilohertz. Your voice is kilohertz. About 25 watts of power if you work out the calories. It's not bad, it's a lot of good computing, considering that these brains, I mean, this, this is an awfully good set of brains here in this room, you do amazing things. And it's 0 .0004 cubic meters. So let's compare that to a supercomputer. I keep changing this slide because when you pick the number one supercomputer, everyone wants to displace. So every time you use it, you have to change it. But right now, at least this morning, the Summit supercomputer was number one ranked at ORNL, Lots of impressive numbers, floating point operations, three gigahertz, all that stuff, 10 to the 17 transistors. So there's way more transistors in it than neurons in your brain. There's enough memory to represent every connection between brain cells. It uses 13 megawatts, which is unfortunate because that's a lot of calories. You know, I like to eat, but I can't eat that much. And it's hundreds of meters. The reason it's not conscious is interconnectivity. That stuff in von Neumann machines, GPUs, what have you, is not connected in the way the brain is. So I think that the singularity is not a problem, nor is it, for, for that matter, a university. So, sorry, I'm not that funny. I try, I try, I really try, I really try. <laughs> Look, so they don't write the material, they support me with the charts. All right, so, so the, the, the DNA, this is where it gets interesting, right? So three gigabases, that is it. That is the human nuclear genome. That's what codes for you. And of that, only 1.1% is the, the DNA that actually gets expressed into final form to make you. Fit on a thumb drive. This PowerPoint presentation consumes more memory than your genome. 
So we're already in a place where you know memory is not the magic. It is, in fact, the unfolding of that data into higher dimensional spaces that makes it work. But just remember that. You could fit on a thumb drive. So then we take the DNA, and forgive me, I know there's a few biologists in the audience, but biologists, you know this already, of course, but we transcribe it from DNA to make something called RNA, which is the next form, and you can see the dimensionality expand. The DNA is base four. You choose from four possibilities. You go to RNA, which is also base four, but then the, the RNA translates into protein, which is base 20. So when you have a higher base, mathematically, you have a bigger fur ball of possibility. So you can see that this compact code is now unfurling into something very complicated. So if you look at how information is stored, and you know, I'm not going to get into the, the math, it's, but it's interesting, a base 2 computing bits, 1s and zeros is optimal for error space, because if you have an error, it can only go one other place, right? So it's not like it can go to a fur ball. The optimum is E, the optimum base for, energy for information storage, but it's impractical. It's a floating point number. We have trouble building memory with floating point bases. So base three is actually theoretical, and it was tried. It didn't work out so well. But nature's base is four, which is not bad. It's within spitting distance of ideal, and it works really well. So if you look at proteins, we're getting closer to making us right from this code. The typical protein, the average protein, has 78 amino acids in it, these letters of code for biology. That gives us 20 to the 78th, or 3 times 10 to the 101 power. That's a ridiculous, crazy number. It's, I, I don't have a word for it. I'm sure there's a formal word for that number, but it's a big number. That's the average protein. So the combinations are insane. So people say, oh, I'll just compute. Uh, it's just big data. Wrong. It's impossible. And I'll give you further examples. I hope that in the end you agree with me, but if you don't, that's okay. We can talk later. Let's look at a real important protein, the antibody. I'll explain later how much of the drug market, how much of the benefit to humanity from pharma <coughs> comes in this form. But the part of it that makes it work, that sticks to the bad molecules, the viruses, the cancers, the things we're trying to get rid of, is 110 amino acids. That gives 10 to the 143rd power possibilities. Frickin' impossible to compute till the end of time. So you can't do it by brute force. That's why I always say this. Biology is not language nor code. It's much more complicated than that. There are side effects. I get it. But the computer that life runs on is self-modifying, evolving, it's not a stationary system, and it's all interlinked. And in fact, if it weren't for the compartments inside cells, every single molecule in a cell could touch every other molecule in 10 or 20 milliseconds. So basically, in instantly, they're all in communication. That's why cells evolve these little baskets, keep things separated. Amazing. It turns out, that's Darwin, by the way, one of my heroes, the biological computer is still running. It's been running for 3.5 billion years. That's crazy. So the point I'll come to is we need to leverage that sunk cost. Now, with all that evolution, we've gotten pretty good. We make 100 billion antibodies a day. 100 million, sorry, antibodies every day. All of us do. That's a big number. And they normally work to keep us healthy from the cold, the flu, whatever it is they're fighting. And many people believe that they're snuffing out microcancers in us every day. And when something breaks through, that's when things get serious. But they mostly work, and it's amazing. So the question is, how do we find the drugs? We need more drugs. This is a good kind of drug to make. But computation magically cannot do it. As I've been saying, trying to at least convince you, it's beyond all known computing. And it's not a problem that's magically solved by quantum computing. It, it just isn't. There are only 10 to the 81 atoms in the entire universe. So you couldn't even build a transistor for all the possibilities of the most basic protein. It's just not doable. And no matter how fast you run the computer, it's not going to work. So how do we do it? We need to keep going. And so I'm not leaving you on a down note. I want to leave you on an up note. I think we can do it. Why? Well, this chart, I hope, conveys that, that six of the top 10 treatments are antibodies. These things I was telling you about that are an infinite set of possibilities. Cancers, autoimmune diseases, Everybody in the room has either been touched by it or knows someone who's been touched by it. or it's, it's everywhere. These drugs address that. The 2020 
Estimated sales for antibodies is $125 billion. It's a lot, and the top drug alone is $20 billion. It's a lot. The downside of this is the cost of getting drugs on the market, and Young mentioned Arum's Law. That's Moore's Law spelled backwards. And it's not funny, but it is the cost of getting a, the number of drugs, sorry, you can get on the market per billion dollars. And if you look at that chart, we crossed that line somewhere around 1995. So we got one drug per billion. If you extrapolate that line somewhere around 2025, 2030, the lifetime revenue of a top drug will not pay for the cost of getting it on the market, which clearly says something's insane. So we have to solve this problem. But the part that really is the humbling part is that combinatorial space, this sea of infinite possibilities and molecules, is really like empty space. That's why brute force won't work. It's mostly nothing, with little islands of something. We're very good at mining the area around the islands of something, but it's mostly nothing. So brute force, no matter what computer you have, won't get you there. So it really is like this, you know, um, the nothing, and then if you're panning around in there, looking randomly, it's like panning for gold in the ocean. You're not likely to get much. However, point I was making earlier, nature has already sunk four billion, three and a half billion years of computing into this. So that's where the opportunity lies, is harnessing that. Not brute forcing, but finessing. And so I wanted to give you a sense for where we are today in this and leave you with a good feeling, I hope. So in the 70s, we hit a period where bits were expensive and computers were really slow. And so we wanted to do math. We used physical circuitry that literally embodied integrals, derivatives, differential equations, and the computers, which are clunky, took the numbers, made voltages, fed them to the circuit, waited for the circuit to do its magic, and then read back the numbers and said, there you go. That's the integral of whatever it was. They were called hybrid computers. And so if you take that analogy, the stuff we can't compute being controlled by computers, you get this. Matter, compute thyself. And there's a program that DARPA started to do exactly this, and I'm proud to be associated with one group who's doing a great job of this. But basically the idea in general is this. You use whatever comp computational tools you like, AI, machine learning. I'm told, by the way, if you need to tell them apart, that uh, machine learning is written in Python and AI is written in PowerPoint. <laughs> I told you I'm not that funny. Um, but anyway, so you, 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 you parallelize the grunge work of doing the bench work, you let the robots do that, and then you make or probe libraries and find the good. So you're not panning in the ocean, you're panning in a puddle. So it's all about closing that loop. And when you find these filaments of goodness in the vacuum, you learn them. And you try to extract some of the mathematical rules, which I think are way, way, way beyond this or the next generations. Uh, hopes, but something we must aspire to. So the DARPA Make It program kicked off what I think are two of the most amazing programs I've ever seen in my life. These are both automated mass chemistry programs, and the one, you know, I get to hang out with the geniuses behind the SRI one, basically they can explore vast tracts of chemistry space in an automated way driven by computers. Fantastic. And then my colleague, Klaus Jensen, who I've known for many years at MIT, they did it a little differently. They had a robot arm in it. So the robot changes the plumbing. Ours is self-changing plumbing. But anyway, the point is, you can do this exploration, and we're just getting started, and this, I think, is going to be absolutely fabulous. So what we can do now is pan through massive libraries, and we can create natural and artificial molecules in huge numbers, and ask a question like, does it stick to this disease molecule? Does it bind and maybe inactivate it, or does it bind and light it up so we can send something else in to do the kill? We can do that, and there's beautiful technologies that do that. They manage large libraries, and libraries now can be built on the scale of 10 to the 11. That's a lot of molecules over the course of a day and analyzed over the course of a week. That's remarkable. That's faster than light for evolution. The other thing that we're really good at getting good at and getting really better at is perturbing around known good molecules. It's amazing that you can take a benzene ring and a few extra atoms and take from that and make drugs and toxins and crazy flavorings, all these things, and they look pretty much the same. And there's not a lot of difference between the matter, just how it's stuck together. 
So we're getting really good at perturbing around those islands of goodness, those solar systems that nature has found. So basically, we're, we're now wrapping computers around this, and that's the era we've just entered, and it's super exciting, super, super exciting. And again, there's the perturbation stuff and then the computer stuff. So I really think we have a bright future, and I'll give one example and then stop, is we have a program, I, I see at SRI, where we find artificial molecules. And we wanted to find a molecule for IL-6, which is a target of some interest for rheumatoid and other diseases. It's an autoimmune disease target. And so they were able to, this group was able to screen 50 million compounds in one week. They found a bunch of hits, and they found that little tiny molecule on the left and on the right to scale as an antibody. That molecule is really exciting because you can boil it for 36 hours, it'll fold back up and do its thing, and it's also amenable to continuous flow. You can make it in big vats. So there's a great future, and this is one of the first examples of the new age, synthesizing new molecules that nature didn't, but taking the guidance that nature got from all that sunk compute cost. So with that, I will say thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>